Flavor could save your life. The human sense of flavor is nothing short of miraculous. If humans have one singular superpower, this might be it. It might even be the most important tool you have for determining what to feed your body. In fact, without it, we might not have even survived as a species. The human sense of flavor is the most overlooked and underappreciated superpower we have, and it's unlike anything else in the animal kingdom. So in this video, we're going to learn how it works and why it might be a golden key to your health. It's amazing, and the more I learn about it, the more impressive and interesting it gets. It has the power to literally save your health span, adding years to your life and life to your years. I know that's cliche, but it's true. Hello, lovely people. I'm Aaron Arnold. Welcome to Eat Is Love TV. First off, we need to set something straight. Flavor and taste are not the same thing. Taste is strictly what your tongue does. It can sense five tastes, salt, sweet, sour, bitter, and umami. And disabuse yourself of that old myth that each of those tastes is limited and relegated to a specific area of your tongue. Not true. Your whole tongue can taste all five tastes. If you don't believe me, then get some vinegar and try to find the place on your tongue where you can't taste it. You won't find it because it doesn't exist. Actually, quick rabbit hole on the human tongue, because this is really interesting. Those bumps all over your tongue are called papilla. Papilla are of four types. Filiform are the most abundant and the only type not capable of sensing taste, mostly touch. Fungiform, which have taste buds, and again, each one can detect all five flavors, so get that myth out of your head. Foliate papilla, which also have taste buds that can detect all the things. And circumvallate papilla, which are also able to taste the tastes. Now, did you catch that? The most abundant type of papilla have no sense of taste. What that means is that your tongue, as a sensing organ, is much more concerned with touch than taste. So your tongue, which is much better at touch than taste, can actually only discern five flavors, salt, sweet, bitter, sour, and umami. Now, if you're a person who has ever eaten food, which I'm assuming you are, then you know that there are a lot more than five flavors. Now, luckily, taste is just one element of flavor. Flavor has been proven time and time again to be a multi-sensory experience, and blind tests have proven unequivocally that flavor is the sum of, yes, taste, and as you probably already know, smell, but also touch, sight, hearing, environment, and even the mental and emotional state of the eater. There's a lot to this, and if you'd like to see a whole video that unpacks this a little more, leave a comment, and I'll follow up with that. Of all the influences on our sense of flavor, chief among them is smell. Smell contributes more to our sense of flavor than anything. The human sense of smell gets a bad rap. All you ever hear is how inferior our sniffer is compared to bears or dogs or even cats. Now, while it's true that their noses can detect things thousands, if not millions, maybe even a hundred million times better than ours, our sense of smell is, in some ways, vastly superior to any other animal. Surprised? Yeah, me too. I mean, how does that work, right? All we hear is that the noses of dogs and bears and other carnivores is so superior, and we just suck, and all that pessimism crap. But as it turns out, well, it's a number of things. Now, while it's true that the human schnoz is not as large as that of, say, a bear's, and because of that, we don't have as large of an olfactory epithelium, which means not nearly as many olfactory receptors in our nose. But the fact is that it's not just a matter of size. There's more going on. For one, our schnoz, despite having only 5 million smell receptors, is located in a really auspicious place, directly above our esophagus. Now, this gets a little gross here, but the smell of things we've already eaten waft up our esophagus long after we've eaten them, and our sniffer is located in the perfect place to catch those odorants. Think about pesto. I love pesto, by the way. But when you eat it, you can keep smelling the garlic and basil and pine nuts for hours and hours, 
and this is enhanced by the fact that we breathe and smell through the same passage, so we kind of can't help it. When odors come into our nose from the backside that way, it's called retronasal olfaction, which means uh, things that we smell that come into our nose from the backside that way. Now think about a dog. Their sniffer with its 300 million sensors is located out front, relatively separate from their esophagus. Even an elephant, who have way more olfactory sensors than even a bear, keep their noses out in front of their body, well apart from their digestive tract which is probably a good thing since nothing smells worse than elephant esophagus. I don't know. I have no idea if that's true. I just made it up. But if you think about it, it's, it's a blessing and a curse for dogs. They have this amazing sense of smell, but they're made to spend all their living days smelling dog breath. Poor little pups. So if you think about it, though, you can add this to the long list of advantages to walking upright. Who knew? Walking upright gave us a super-duper uber capacity for retronasal olfaction from the digestive tract, giving us the superpower of experiencing flavor in ways that no other animal can. I'll bet they didn't teach you that in 7th grade science class. They were probably too busy teaching you that the different tastes can only be sensed by certain parts of the tongue. Oh, the education system. All I learned in school was useless junk like how to read, how to do math, how to research information, how to learn, social skills, and oh, so many other useless endeavors. But I digress. So our sniffer is perfectly positioned to really fine-tune the odors of the food that we've eaten. And in the same way that tastes are various combinations of the five basic tastes that our tongue can detect, our olfactory receptors have 400 different types. In other words, we can detect any combination of 400 different molecules, which mathematically speaking is a uh, uh, square root mean to carry the four sum of, ah, uh, uh, yes, a lot. Very cool. But it gets better because what's on the other side of our olfactory bulb? That's right. Our very, very way cool brain. And not just that, but actually the parts of the brain that are responsible for memory and emotion. Okay, so let's have a little fun with this. Smell, memory, and emotion are really closely related. I have a strong feeling that you're already nodding your head and saying, yeah, 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 I totally get that. Our favorite smell people like to use for thought experiments, of course, is good old fresh cut grass. Not bad. But a better one for me, personally, is the smell of a wet sidewalk after a rainstorm. But, you know, pull up either one of those, whatever. Chances are good that you're going to bring back some memories. For me, more than one. I remember watching rainstorms with my mom and then running outside to build little dams in the gutter, and that leads to memories of the smell of the mud and the twigs that we used to use to make those marvels of engineering. And each of those memories brings back emotions. I remember how much I loved my mom. I remember the unabated joy of running down the street after busting the first dam and watching them all collapse in succession. Now, as for fresh cut grass... I mostly just remember mowing the lawn as a kid and not being super happy about it. But I do remember that it was often a sign of the arrival of summer, and that was a little more joyful. So obviously you have your own stories, but I'm willing to bet that every smell brings back memories and emotions associated with those memories. Do this with as many smells as you want. Well, maybe watch the video first, because i got to please the algorithm and all that. But you'll find that smells are an utterly reliable search engine to recalling not just memories, but the subtle emotional states associated with those memories. How many times have you gone to a place that you hadn't been to in a while, and the smell of the place immediately brought back all those emotions? My hometown was renowned for its proximity to the world's largest cattle yard. So weirdly, I and a lot of the people I grew up with have a lot of memories associated with cow manure. It's amazing I'm not a vegan by now. Another quick thought experiment demonstrates that visual memories are treated differently. Try to remember a smell. Anything. Now you saw that thing in your mind too, didn't you? Now try to remember a smell without seeing the thing in your head. You can't do it. Now try it the other way around. Imagine what something looks like, but try to not recall its smell. It's pretty easy, isn't it? You can even imagine something with a strong odor like an orange without remembering its smell. So smell's relationship to memory and emotion is really unique. Think about food and holidays now. Each holiday has its own menu and with it its own set of flavors and smells. 
For me, beer brats will always remind me of Oktoberfest. This is so fun. I could talk about this forever, but again, the YouTube algorithm says you'll get bored if I go on too long. So again, if you want more on this topic, hit me up in the comments. But for now, let's imagine how this impacted our evolution, because it's huge. When we were foraging for food back in the way back, the times that we ate something that made us sick, that memory really etched itself in our brains, including the emotional memory. We remembered how miserable we were after we ate something that didn't agree with us. Similarly, if we ate something that made us feel really good, we remembered that too. And the amount we ate also stayed with us. Herbs, for instance, can not only taste good in the right amounts, but can actually be medicinal, and our brains can store that. But that same thing in large amounts, eh, maybe not so much. Time. Time tastes awesome and can help fight bacterial and fungal infections. But if you ate an entire bush, you'd get really sick of the flavor and maybe just a little sick, period. I mean, it certainly would not make you feel great. So our brains not only store the big obvious things like how the food made us feel, but our brains can actually detect how foods affect us on a cellular level. But more on that later. If you're a prehistoric hunter-gatherer, can you imagine the power of a tool that can tell you what's safe to eat and even better, what makes you feel good? That's a life-death matter. Prehistoric people spent by far most of their time and energy on finding food. And it's a good thing that they didn't have to test each one every time they found it. Bob Holmes, in his incredible book on flavor, cryptically titled Flavor, describes smell as the most ancient and fundamental sense. The way he puts it is, smell is the most ancient and fundamental sense. And he's right. Smell goes way, way, way back in the history of life. It came before vision, before hearing, and long before the prefrontal cortex. Early and simple life forms had some version of flavor or smell or something like them. No other sense is as closely related to memory and emotion. This book, by the way, is amazing. It's one of the best things I've ever read. But I have to honestly tell you that it it doesn't smell like much of anything. And I would taste it, but that would be really rude because I'm going to give this book away. Yes, this very book. The first person to type a flavor or a smell of something and the thing it reminds you of in the comments field will get this book. Yes, this very book. So go to the comments, write a flavor or a smell, and then say what it reminds you of. And if you're the first person to do so, you will get this very neutral smelling book. But hey, even if you're not the first one, you should just do it anyway, because it's fun. I'd love to see what memories you associate with flavors and smells. But still, the first person to do this is extra special and will get a free copy of one of my very favorite books of all time. And when you read it, you'll know where I got like, 70% of the information in this video. But this video is so much more succinct and so much more fun because it has B-roll. Take that, Bob Holmes, who wrote a fascinating book that rewrote a large part of my worldview. Ha! Huh, small beans. Beans, by the way, don't have a super strong odor. In fact, I can't even recall if they smell like much. But, I don't, I don't know, maybe beans don't smell like much until after you eat them. Was that a fart joke? No fart jokes in the Food Show channel conversation. Wait a minute, who am I, who am I talking to? There's nobody in here. Anywho, I was just trying to tie in the beans, but you know, it turns out you can't really tie a bean. Maybe these long Asian ones that can... Another really amazing thing about our sense of flavor is that there are multiple studies on something called nutritive reward, which is another superpower. Animals, and not just us, but even some insects, have the ability to be attracted to the flavors of things that our bodies need, even on a very fine level. In one experiment, grazing sheep favored the plants that aided their gastric distress, and once that melody was addressed, they stopped going after those plants as specifically. A study done in the 20s, because a study like this would be like so illegal now, and, and rightly so. But a bunch of babies were allowed to eat anything they wanted, and they just naturally favored foods that not only treated things they were suffering from, but also the macronutrients that matched their stage in life, like protein when they were in a growth spurt, or carbohydrates when they were particularly active. My 
God, do you know what that means? This is huge. It means your body knows what it needs. Your brain and your cravings will point you to the foods that you need to support your health. Now, that doesn't mean you load up on beer and ice cream. It's not that kind of craving. But it's more like a language you need to learn to speak. I mean, suppose, for instance, you are craving a junk burger. Fine. But instead of hitting the drive through think about what is in that burger and what else might satisfy that craving. Is it the fat? Okay, imagine some other fatty foods. Do those sound just as good? No? Okay, maybe it's the protein. Imagine some protein-rich foods and take note of those sound as good. No? Okay, maybe it's the carbs in the bun. Imagine some other grain-based foods or high-carb foods and see if that did the trick. Whichever it was, now think about other foods that provide the thing you wanted. Suppose it was the fat. So imagine some things that are high in fat and then try to pick things on that list that are actually healthy. You know, like avocado, coconut, salmon, walnuts. Now try to think of a food that scratches the itch for you, but is maybe a little bit healthier than a fast food burger. You see how that works? Your body wasn't lying when it told you to get that burger. You just need to learn how to interpret the language. So I strongly advocate getting yourself educated on reliable nutrition information. More on that later. But when you're actually choosing a food, don't just trust a book to tell you how to eat. Your body is smarter than all the books. One author whom I really do respect is Mark Hyman, who says so succinctly that your body is the best doctor in the room. And it's really true. If your body wants protein and your food fad latest greatest hip diet cookbook says to avoid protein, forget the book. Get some protein preferably a good quality protein, because not all proteins are created equal, but that's another topic for another video. But for now, it's time to wrap up this video. I appreciate your watching, and of course, I would be remiss to not remind you that if you found this video of value, and if you'd like to see more content like this made, if you'd like to continue to be part of the conversation, please, please do hit the like and subscribe buttons, comment in the comments, watch more of my videos, watch videos from other creators on the same topic, support the channel and show your appreciation because I appreciate you. So it's only fair. I don't want this to be a one-sided relationship. You are special to me. So I really hope that I'm special to you too. This is how we heal the world, see? See, I told you food was about everything. Okay, thanks for watching. Ciao.